Now this talk is kind of going, quite going to be quite open for discussion um, and unlike our previous talks where the speakers will kind of speak individually, this is going to be more of a like a group presentation and discussion with lots of time for kind of questions and sharing ideas and everything at the end. Um, so feel free to kind of contribute and share your thoughts and your questions at the end. Um, either in the chat or you can raise your hand. So this is the 11th in our series of um, online artist talks. My name is Hannah Fletcher and I'm one of the uh, co-directors of London Alternative Photography Collective and also the founder of the Sustainable Darkroom. Um, so this month we're kind of uh, in this talk, we're exploring ideas of collaboration and cross-disciplinary modes of working across photography. Um, you know, photography doesn't exist alone in the art world. It's connected and supported and sustained by a multitude of other industries and disciplines. Um, to work towards a sustainable future of photography, we really need to draw on these cross-connections and ensure that all links in the chain have an environmental and social longevity. So within the Sustainable Darkroom, we've been considering the wider ecosystem of photography um, and how we can work towards a shift in the culture of the photographic industry to create a kind of future ecosystem based around knowledge, consciousness and a responsibility towards the environment. So here to discuss these ideas with me today uh, are three creative practitioners who work collaboratively and they took part in the Sustainable Darkroom Repurpose Residency that took pl place last April. So this was a digital research and development residency um, where throughout the month of April we explored the themes recycle, remove, repurpose and rework. Uh, Gemma Foster, Laura Copsey and Emily Rudge are a collaborative trio. They share knowledge and skills that cover botany, astroherbalism, photography, film, music and art therapy. They met in 2019 and they share an interest in the alchemy of plants and their potential within creative processes. Working out of the wild alchemy lab, and taking part in various workshops and residencies, their ongoing research into cameraless photography explores eco-developers and fixatives to draw with light. Made with organic plant-based eco-developers, fixatives and natural inks to create bespoke artifact images. Their intention is to showcase alternative photosensitive ingredients. And they have a particular interest in creating sensory experiences using edible items that also have image making potential. Running workshops that involve experimental cameraless photography combined with taster menus and bespoke drinks as an accompaniment made from ingredients used to create visual responses that document and experience. Their ingredients are often foraged and seasonal, taking inspiration from the alchemical elements, uh, the tarot and the stars. They believe in the magical properties of plants and nature as their guide to navigate an uncertain future. They hope to inspire people to create art sustainably and in symbiosis with the natural world. So I'm really excited to hear more from these three today. Um, and I'll hand straight over to them. Hello, thank you so much, Hannah, for that introduction. I'm Laura, I don't know what order you're in, Emily, Gemma, on my Hello, screen. Emily. <laughs> um, yeah, I'll, shall I share my screen? Um, uh, so Hannah was introducing us as talk, talking about photography, but none of us are photographers. So that's interesting from the get go how we ended up in the sustainable dark room but um well it's a very good detailed summary Hannah I feel like we don't really have much else to say <laughs> <laughs> you've done it for us Hannah yeah <laughs> yeah so we're going to try and make this chilled and not like a talk talk hopefully it will be more of a conversation like Gemma was talking about how like podcasts maybe we can try and just have a chat so if people want to like chip in and talk um, please do. Can you see that, everybody? Yeah. 
They can pop any questions in the chat box as we go. Mm. And the weird thing is, I can't see you now I've shared my screen. It's gone all a bit like, anyway, okay. That's weird. But. So right, yeah, this we've, we've called the talk Collaboration and Cross-Disciplinary Ways of Working, which sounds really serious, but hopefully this conversation won't be too serious. Um, we're three, um, well, very different disciplined people that came together and it was kind of Emily, wasn't it, that you were the instigator? Yeah, well, we, we met, um... Uh, Laura and I met when we did a Lux workshop with Carol Doing, um, uh, and basically we had our, uh, a passion for interest in finding out more about kind of phytograms, and so experimented uh, with those and and did a workshop with him, and worked with sixteen mil film as you can see here. Um, and Laura and I immediately hit it off and also shared a passion of working with photography in, in general and also 16 mil we've done workshops with Not Nowhere and uh, James Holcomb as well. Um, and so through, through that, uh, Gemma and I had been collaborating previously. Uh, and so I knew that we would be a kind of good match to all bring together uh, because Gemma was, she'll go on to it later, but um, really interested in sort of plants and the alchemy of them. And so we were at that time wanting to uh, just experiment with, with art and just play around basically and, and have fun while doing it and thought that Laura would be a good addition to our little team. I was super glad to meet you. And um, this workshop was really fun. And I think um, it was just chatting on the way to the station, wasn't it? We swapped emails and then, um, but this process is really great. It's called Phytograms. Um, hopefully the slide has changed. I can't see you. But this process is um, developed by a filmmaker called Carol Doing that I know has recently actually done stuff with, um, with the London Alternative Photography Collective running workshops and talks and things. Um, this process is great. You can forage stuff make developers out of plants um, and then use it for 16 millimeter and for also for um, images as well. And you get really interesting mark making. So, and my background, I'm an sort of illustrator, artist. Um, sometimes I call myself, yeah, I don't know always how I define myself, but I'm an illustrator really, I'm a storyteller and I'm interested in kind of like landscapes and like how you can forage things from a place and turn it into an image. And this process is just totally brilliant. So if anyone's interested, we can put a link to this process to Carol's website at the end. Hmm. But um, yeah, so Gemma Studio, we met up here. Do you want to tell us about the studio, Gemma? Uh, yeah, the, the chaos in the studio. <laughs> that was, in terms of like creative collaboration, that was like such an exciting moment to have us all in there because at that point, Emily and I had been working on some experiential uh, events, which is part of Mama Xanadu, which is the botanical studio that I run, which has now morphed into the World Alchemy Lab. And that began also doing supper clubs and workshops, working with wild ingredients and with herbal medicine uh, from the narrow boat, which is moored up next to the studio. And then when we all met in the studio together that night, and we'd also, I'd been exploring uh creating like an astro uh dinner so a supper club which was using ingredients which were all uh each plant has an astrological ruler it's ruled by a planet in in astro herbalism so you would have an entire meal which is kind of telling the story of the stars and that kind of overlapping with uh, laura's work and wanting to create like a, a edible art essentially where everything that you can see is edible it's also part of the uh, creative process uh, and also I have a background in foraging so being able to use wild ingredients which you can see all that kind of the chaos of jars and it goes right the way to the back <laughs> and gets even more chaotic with things that have been foraged and some things forgotten about which actually it turned out I've forgotten about a two-year-old uh, uh, lacto-fermented wild garlic which turned out to be one of the best developers so <laughs> There's nothing wrong with letting stuff go. Um, it was so good because we were all just sitting around and then Gemma, you just kept going in getting jars and you were like, oh, I think this will work. Oh, I think this will work. Should we try blue lotus flowers? Should we try smoky garlic? Should we try um, black 
um, Kelpash or something. You kept bringing all these pots. It felt like we were in an old fashioned like apothecary and I was a bit like, oh my God, this is amazing. <laughs> um, but so much of it worked. We started experimenting, um, but maybe we should talk about what our different roles are. How, you've got so many jobs, Gemma, what like roles or how do you define yourself? <laughs> Uh, plants, people, plants, planets. <laughs> yeah, yeah I, I think like we've all got very kind of diverse uh, disciplines and that's what's the most exciting thing I think uh, within my own work and then working collaborating with people and learning you know it's, it was like from you explaining the photographic process and then working out what was going on uh, in the chemistry of it then we were finding replacements. It was sort of drawing from nature. And I think like, we would all be able to just kind of give each other ideas and sort of go from one, join the dots. Mm -hmm. um, it was really fun playing, doing all these things. We, I think the next slide is some of the recipes that we were trying to use. I think what we started with lots, well, we started with the basic developer that Emily and I used at, um, the workshop with, with Carol doing, which was a really simple um, mixture of just water, soda crystals and vitamin C. And our intention was just to literally replace the soda crystals and the vitamin C with other um, substances. But um, at this point, I'd also discovered um, a filmmaker who I'd seen recently has been with LARP as well, um, doing Davey Brundvert who has a really incredible website with like she had loads of really generous recipes on it so I've been mucking about with seaweed and stuff but then Gemma's shop of of wonders like Emily and I we were in our element just like adding different things in trying to figure out how to replace the soda crystals and the vitamin c um yeah and so we realized too when when we were there that rosehip and sea buckthorn had a really high vitamin c content so we were um, swapping those out to, to, to add in. Although as, as Gemma pointed out, you get, it's quite expensive sea buckthorn and, and rosehip. So you'd, we made a little bit and had to, had to uh, minimize our amount that we were making. Mm. Yeah, it's not necessarily the most cost-effective and this is the amount of anyone's ever picked sea buckthorn. Um, it's the thorny part, it's quite tricky. <laughs> um, but also we then tried to, to minimize the soda too, because the soda was the, the ultimately toxic part. It was quite easy to replace the vitamin C. And then beyond yeah. this version, we also went, looked at the uh, commercial uh, chemicals and saw that they were very high in phenols, um, sodium thiosulfate, metal and hydroquinone. Um, and so we started to look at the plants that are high in phenols too, which is essentially all the really aromatic rosemary and oregano and sage and those sorts of things, which could then, when they're in that, they become the developer themselves when they're kind of um, activated by the solution. So that's opened up a whole new avenue. Mm. Yeah, um, and this is some of the stuff that we were doing, isn't it? We were just basically drawing but maybe a little bit of photogramming occasionally um but not not low lumen prints more um it's more lumen prints just using light and this is a bit of photogramming where you put the the plants directly into the developer until they become quite soggy and then you can get quite detailed mark making from the shapes of the plants if you're quite careful with it um which carol doing has done to like a really incredible extent like meticulous um I don't think well I haven't got the patience for that level of meticulous I quite like the play and the experiments um but this is yeah some of the stuff that we were doing um oh yeah foraging we during the sustainable darkroom we didn't actually have much of an opportunity to do that because the lockdown had just come in so the whole the whole of the residency shifted it completely changed um, and we had to do it online but it was a really good experience like we were um, still trying to do the same thing like but being remote we weren't together so that it sort of shifted over the week and we had to sort of more use kitchen cupboard stuff rather than things that we'd foraged um, so yeah it kind of became pretty DIY um, 
from every... this picture of cleavers that we were managing to get from the park that was about as close as much as we could do <laughs> I had singing nettles in my back garden so that was a nettle. yeah yeah <laughs> stuff in the studio was forage but but it, it's all sort of dried and preserved and luckily I had that kitchen cupboard yeah no I, I didn't have any any much to play with I had some seaweed I had some sushi seaweed um we had a whole load of different things which we'll come on to but every day we picked like a tarot cards and we talked about kind of the astrological forecast for the day um we we talked about doing like Wim Hof meditation in the mornings, but we never actually got up early enough. <laughs> <laughs> um, but we tried to have a bit of a ritual about how we approached. Gemma, you picked runes every day as well. Like it, we kind of tried to make it into a theme for the week. For today is the harvest rune. And we were talking about this. It's almost a year since we um, did the, the residence. And the harvest one is it's, it's a year cycle, so it's a completion of something that will take a year. Either that this is the culmination of it, or that this is this will be something that you know through collaborating and through meeting and discussing all these ideas with all of you, that maybe something comes of it that completes next year. That's a good dream to pick because this did feel really nice putting together. Actually, like looking back on all of our stuff, like it was really nice to sort of see where it's how it all came together even though it seems like quite a long time ago now. So this was what we did to start with, wasn't it? We ran a workshop together at the Ace Hotel. Um, yeah, after we'd met, first of all, exactly, and we were kind of experimenting, and it was around Christmas time. So uh, Gemma had, a, had already had a contact at the Ace Hotel, and so we'd collaborated on a, a kind of a phytogram craft workshop where people could come and play with us and then take away little cards and and gifts and gift tags yeah and we made we made the developers out of things that were festive didn't we we, we used mulled wine and rose sip and rosemary um like, like, yeah and like mulled spice like cinnamon <laughs> um so it smelled quite nice in the room uh, <laughs> well not towards the end i think the chemicals of um the soda crystals slightly took over but at the beginning it was really aromatic in there um Although we, we didn't talk about um, before, I guess the, the one thing that we're, we're still sort of developing on, which is what we, we were aiming at at the beginning, was that caustic soda replacement, which ah. when we were doing the, the first kind of um, session in the studio, we, we found the different, different replacements for vitamin C quite easily, but the caustic soda wasn't um, as easy to find. So yeah, unfortunately, there's still a chemical element in in what we've been using but then let Gemma uh did do some research and found do you want to talk about the line well, yeah it's interesting because there's you know to what extent we go to to have something that's sort of organic but because essentially the um soda ash you can make lye the process of making lye is very toxic in itself you just it, it seems very innocuous because all it is is water and ash but the process that kind of makes potassium hydroxide is it has this huge like noxious fumes like you have to do it outside it's very volatile it can explode like it i began to do it and then realized that i didn't have the space to do it um so that would be one option but yeah it's a very toxic process so you know it's we still, we're still the jury's out on the replacement for caustic soda. Mm. Yeah, if anyone's got any ideas about that, actually, at the end, maybe, mm. I think lots of people yeah. have probably been trying to come up with ways, but maybe the alternative is, isn't, I don't know, it'd be interesting to talk about whether the level of replacement that you have to go to is, is sustainable enough to replace the thing that you're trying to replace anyway. Um, <laughs> Yeah, if you had like a barrel and you had, if anyone, anyone has outdoor space and has a big barrel, then you, because I started the process by getting, I had loads of uh, foreign seaweed, so I made kelp ash. And then you then go through a process of you, uh, it sits in water and then it becomes potassium hydroxide and then you filter it and it, it's a bit of a process, but it, you just need the space and you need the, the, you know, the protection and things to do it. Not, not in a small space in London. <laughs> yeah, difficult. Um, so well, Melanie, 
asked a question the 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 cards are photograms on on paper we they're actually it's photographic paper that we that we've sort of stuck on bits of card yeah so it's a combination of like dipping different plants into fixative or into into dev so it's it's i guess it's a kind of a chemigram mixed with a phytogram i mean we're not photographers so we're probably getting all the terminology wrong <laughs> we're just playing with mark making using forageables and actually sometimes the plants um because of the chemicals within the plants themselves react with the paper depending on whether you use colored paper or black and white paper and it you can get some quite interesting marks you can get unexpected colors um, and you can get really deliberate with it as well um if you want to which is something that i'm having more fun with lately trying to actually create like actual tangible images um, from some of these fragments um, but I love the fragments as they are really but like I'm interested in what they can become next a little bit but we made drinks we paired the images with with a drink which I really like yeah. um, can you remember what was in this I think it was rosemary oh, well that's rosemary yeah. which are both really high in vitamin c and then fur, which is on the top which is also very high in vitamin c um, I think that might be it. Yeah, I remember sitting there being really happy with the, with the, how delicious the drink was, and I was holding an image that had been made with the same things that I was drinking, but non toxically. So that that was a nice little moment, and also <laughs> the the water there printed on edible rice paper, so it's like you can consume your element, which is I'm water sign. Um, so yeah, I think it went really well. It was really interesting. There was also another sensory element. There was your plants, Gemma. Should we play this sound? See if this works. Can you hear that? Yep. Maybe explain what's going on. Yeah. I'm not over to go back because it will just keep yeah. looping <laughs> that is a mandrake which I, i'm currently in cos in greece they grow wild all everywhere here and it's a very um sacred plant it's uh it was used a lot of magic it's also um used in it was using like the lice lice serum um in the season the 1920s uh true serum uh, and so the, the device that I use measures the tiny electrical fluctuations between the leaves and the roots or between the two leaves and creates this through uh, MIDI co creates the sound goes into a synthesizer. So we were playing the plants whilst we were in this space. We were also listening to the sound of the plants in the room. So it was like a fully embodied experience. Yeah, it was really good, a really good workshop. And then we put a proposal in to Hannah for the sustainable darkroom. Um, and this was what we suggested was like having a kind of five day um, kind of process based on, um, well, the moon, Mars, Mercury, Jupiter, Venus. You can probably explain it better than me, Gemma, but the idea was to kind of have a structure to the week that was based on the elements where we'd explore sort of specific um, alchemical um, plants or materials that we could find within our um, homes that would potentially make images um, using sustainable developers as much as we could. So that was the plan. Mm. It was a good framework to have, just to, to sort of have our, you know, we, we would be working with the elements, which opened up a lot of different, I mean, I was on the canal, so straight up there was the canal to work with there was the moon to work with so we're working on an alchemical basis um looking at every a planet that rules each day of the week um and the tower and it just yeah and then each planet is also corresponding to particular metals so we also brought that in um someone just asked and it's not something that i think if fiona was asking about um photosensitive paper emulsion if you can make it and i know someone in the sustainable dark room did not us, but that might be something that mm. can answer later, perhaps. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so Monday was Moon Day, water element. Um, so these some of our experiments. 
this was yours, Gemma, wasn't it? You were. Yes, yeah, so the, the cabbage, because cabbage is ruled in astral herbalism, it's ruled by uh, the moon and the water and the moon rules water. Um, so, yeah, that was just using a combination of kelp ash, soda crystals, and the sea buckthorn. So, that was trying to, yeah, trying to just use a little bit less of the soda crystals was at that point, accepting that we weren't going to be able to completely eliminate it. Mm -hmm. And then this developer, I'm sorry, that's not related to the cabbage, that's on the wrong page, but um, yeah, that's the cabbage close up. The logic behind the fix, because that the fix, the fix didn't really work because that picture was taken Straight, almost straight away and then the fix didn't last particularly long because within half an hour it had gone into a very deep purple but the logic behind that was because with this the wanting to take away the work with the silver halide was that with ionic trace minerals that there was that kind of like like attracts like so I kind of I had ionic silver and colloidal silver and just thought maybe and also silver is ruled by the moon in alchemy, so I just figured that um, maybe it would work. Like, like that was a lot of the time throughout that week was just because stuff was lying around. <laughs> Let's see if it works. Yeah, it was really playful. So this this was garlic, sea salt, and um, for the Monday, I thought about trying to um, use moonlight to expose the paper because I'd done that previously with sixteen millimeter film, but um, there was kind of too much light pollution. Um, where I was but I was enjoying the garlic and I think it's a it's more of a folk, folklore thing that werewolves that howl at the moon or supposedly howl at the moon they aren't actually howling at the moon um, that supposedly um, garlic will repel them so I was, that was something that was just in my fridge so I didn't have access to the same kind of materials but um, every day I tried to make to repurpose um, some of the chemigrams that I've made into a tarot card um, so that was my first day. And then this was yours, Emily. This was really fun. This was using um, some uh, cheese to uh, <laughs> expose through, uh, holy cheese, and uh, also developer using kefir as well, which I played around with for the milky milky element. Um, I think, yeah, I was, I, like I said, using it more of kind of experimenting of what you can repurpose within your home. So um, luckily my flatmate had left our flat share. So I made a little homemade dark room in her box room. Uh, only has one window, so it was easy to blank out. So that was kind of my week of experimenting with different developers and household um food in the little um in the little dark room space that I'd I'd made and then Tuesday was Mars and fire um and someone was asking Clara's asking if you left it all night I remember I, I did the same but I it was quite I only had it very quickly out and then moon night, which was yeah good. no that was Laura's moon one it didn't it didn't work where I was there was too much light pollution it just made the I think it needs to be, you need to be somewhere quite dark to be sure that it's definitely moonlight. Mm. It was, it was, there was light from the neighbours. I was like, I don't think it's authentically the moon here. Um, no, I'm pretty sure mine was the canal light. <laughs> yeah, but it's a nice idea, but um, I did it before in like a field in a really dark place. And that I felt more sure that the, the light was from, mm. the 16 millimetre was from the moon, but you can do that. You just have to, you, have, it's, you need a change bag really and to be quite quick with fixing things so that you can kind of maintain the image but um yeah it's, it's doable it's really fun it's quite absurd um up at three in the morning in a field but if anyone's interested in that kind of thing um message me after this because um yeah I like doing that this was my this was Mars day then wasn't it this was yours Gemma playing with fire mm. um we're burning lots of things, but then I also, that's when I really got into the, to making the, to the start the process of the lie by burning vegetable ash and seaweed using kelp and then burning the paper with hot coals, which is not an organic process, but it, it sort of makes this 
really mesmerizing kind of color and it bubbles, bubbles up and then bursts. Uh, mm. yeah, yeah, I was trying to remember, I saw this, um, an artist who was doing a lot with like smoke and expo exposing mm. uh, photography. I, try I was trying to do that in, um, in the little space that I had, but none of them really worked that well. I haven't included them. <laughs> yeah, I didn't try that. Didn't. I think you need a really, really sort of solid setup and help. I think because we were that's the thing where it was lockdown. Like you really need that situation. You need someone who's going to be doing the smoke. Someone who's going to have the flash gun. Yeah. You know, it was all three of us together. Then we probably could have could have done it, but on our own, it's quite hard to just need more hands. Yeah, and you'd need a really dark place, um, if not in a dark room or somewhere mm. that's ventilated. We should do that though. It would be, it would be really fun to try. Um, that's interesting. Are we, are we leaving the chat for later? Because I'm just reading Jess's chat about magnesium hydroxide and maybe using Alka Seltzers. So would that be for the caustic soda, I guess? And then also maybe milk of magnesia. Is milk of magnesia? What was that different? I'm not sure. Yeah. Worth a try. <laughs> yeah. There so might yeah, be someone here. Yeah, that knows. great. These are great um, ideas. Perfect. We have to we have to have a second uh, residency to try and. Yeah. This was this was fire for wax, was it? But um, I can't. Sorry, I can't see the chat. I just interrupted you. Oh, sorry. We can go through it later. If you can't see it. No, I interrupted you but this was um I didn't have anything particularly fiery at home so I was just using wax but it it did work to some degree as a kind of it blocked the light but there was too much light to kind of really get much um impact but I was using garlic and onion and salt and lemon um which did work as a developer um I thought the salt might work as a fix but um it eventually it faded and went quite dark it didn't really the image didn't last but um I didn't mind really that it faded I I, I scanned them anyway to, to save them which I know is not the like not authentic but um I'm interested in how images change over time so I didn't really mind but it, it didn't fix the salt but it was worth a try yeah. and this was 16 millimeter that was burned but just a couple of stills and the tarot card I made for the second day was the magician and this is yours, Emily. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we were um, also experimenting with and the types. Uh, and so this was this kind of fire element of experimenting with some turmeric paste and how that would come out, which it did. It did actually come out on the paper in this amazing kind of gold colour. But again, it didn't fix so well. So it did fade a bit over time. But the first day or two it did look really amazing it's really beautiful yeah and then day three was air uh, the mercury day Gemma this was your um experimental um anthrotype I think yeah so butterfly pea flower is really fun to work with because it's it's the blue and that you can see is how it is when you just make a tea infusion. And then if you add sugar, it goes into the, the purple on the left and then the kind of slightly pinky color on the right happens when you add lemon to it. So I'm kind of using that process. I think the next slide shows the kind of, yeah. So that, that was a wash on the back using the um, butterfly, fly, uh, butterfly pea flower. And then the plants I used were dipped in lemon juice, which then kind of creates that change in color. And I used plants that were ruled by mercury. And then we, and then it kind of gets put, it's the same process to what Emma was saying before, where you, you put a sheet of glass and you put it out in the sun. And I think the next one is the result. Yeah, on, on the left. But it's slightly faded, it was a bit more vibrant at the time, but mm. I've forgotten about lacto-fermented raw garlic. <laughs> there it is. It worked really well as a developer, didn't it? 
Mm, yeah, for, for drawing. And I think um, we'll talk about it later, but also Leo, who does the sauerkraut spell session. But that's what I was thinking would be something that you could do. You could actually write the spells with the sauerkraut onto the photographic paper. I think there was someone from the Sustainable Darkroom that was Sean, I think Sean Roy Parker. I think he was working with sauerkraut, wasn't he? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Sour, sauerkraut, he, was, he had a name for it, sour, like caffeinol, but sauerkrautanol or something. Yeah, kimchi. That was a recipe. Yeah. But that one worked really well. And then this was yours, Emily, for air. But this, this was when we were starting to get into territory of um, making pinhole cameras out of different things. And your, your feather is, was because of your DIY dark green with the photogramming of the feather, which I guess it worked really well. Yeah, I was using feathers and then, and then yes, this was my two housemates. One of them, she'd laugh if I was telling this now, she's in Australia, <laughs> mucking around through sheer boredom on my rooftop, but I think it came out pretty well. I've got a picture of your um, aubergine camera there. Oh yeah, the aubergine, the same rooftop, different person. And then we were, um, we did a day where we were all tried to make a pinhole camera with different objects we can find in the house. It did, my stew box worked a little bit better than my aubergine. Then. Yeah, I've still and got the one. I made well, it. Oh God. <laughs> Bisto, Bisto it's, not, it's not a vegetable, but I didn't have anything that would work. So I made a pinhole camera out of an old Bisto tub which worked really well can you explain the, the people can maybe also try it at home can you explain the we, as you've got it in front of you just yeah it... yeah I don't know if you can see me very well I can't see myself but like it's super easy it's just spray painting the inside of a tub I mean anything will work you can use absolutely anything and I'm sure many of you in the group um, might have done this before but like you just spray paint the internal um, drill a hole in it or stab a hole in it and then use a bit of aluminium can with a tiny pin prick and then tape tape it so that it's airtight um, light tight not airtight and then make a shutter and then what you do is you just put the put the paper on the inside um, and in a change bag so that it's you insert paper into the into the camera in the dark and then when you've measured the light using a light meter you can get a really good light meter just for iPhone actually if anyone wants a recommendation the one I really like the one that I've got is super handy and then you just expose it for the amount of time depending you work out the aperture of the pin based on the diameter of the pinhole versus the amount of light that you've got and then you can work out there's a formula for it which we can share at the end to just quickly kind of expose and then again into the change bag open it get it out and then exp and then um, develop and fix it in a dark room but you can like you can see you can turn a little bedroom into a dark room or you, you can use a bike light um to as long as it's red light um that was a bike light it was that red light there is bike light so you can do it really easily diy i mean it's a bit of a faff because if you want to be really purist about it it's not it's not going to be a perfect image like you would get if you were a professional photographer in a lovely dark room no. but it's I quite like, I like the mistakes anyway, the things that go a bit wonky. You can't, or... you can't see the chat, but I'm uh, uh, like Robin Chelson's just said, I love chats like these, where else would you hear the sentence? My shoebox worked better than my own thing. <laughs> 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 I totally agree. Um, and also, hang on a minute, um, where did I miss that? Catherine says she's currently turning living trees into pinhole cameras by putting light sensitive paper into the cavity and ceiling with a homemade pinhole lens. That is amazing. Gorgeous. Mm. Yeah. And mm -hmm. also Louise, who's a um, natural dyer, who was saying that adding acid makes plants dye brighter and alkaline makes them darker, which also reminds me of when we're talking about the <clears throat> using the plants that are very high in fennels, that they're much, they're higher during spring when they kind of had that real burst of, of energy so it's also interesting looking at the the seasons and how the the sort of uh phytochemistry changes throughout the year mm. what you can get i can't yeah. remember what, i can't actually remember what the next slide is oh i so day three day four and five we went off piste and i started um i was really off piste 
I made a music video and then <laughs> um, I'm, I'm in a band as well. So I started using some of the stuff that we were making to, to for that at the time we were doing like a lockdown record, making maps and more tarot cards. But I think by day four, we, I think we kind of sort of, we, we stopped a bit, didn't we? In terms of, we, well, we were just processing everything that we'd done so far, um, which was quite a lot, but we had this big list of ingredients that then we started to think about the supper club that we wanted to do, which was part of um, our proposal. And we were really pleased that like everyone in the group was really up for it. And everyone thought it would be fun to put on an event at guest projects, which would be kind of a collaboration um, making like, I don't know, tablecloths, crockery, trying to make as much of it edible and photographic at the same time as possible. So we had this big list of potential ingredients um, that we'd used and yeah, being a bit playful with it. Long Island iced pea. <laughs> um, <laughs> that, that does anyone want to explain that? Hannah, do you want to explain that? <laughs> It came out of the fix when we were talking that a good fixative would be ammonia or urine, basically. And then Sean, what did Sean? Sean used it. Yeah, so did Nettie. I think most. I think. I think I they did. all did actually. Yeah, I did. Trying oh. to. <laughs> um, Blood, sweat, and tears, and urine at the end of it. I don't know what that says about the the state of us at the end of the residency. Yeah, we were all a bit. There was a lot of hilarity. But I don't know who came up with the title. It might have been Nettie, actually. I think we... it was Nettie. Megan just said, where's Nettie? Yeah, it was Nettie. Yeah, Long Island iced pea, we thought, um, should be the drink for the evening. But obviously, it wouldn't actually be that. But, like, using no. some of the... <laughs> We'd call it that on the menu. But um, we we had... It could have been... Um, could have been great. But, unfortunately, the lockdown. So, we couldn't... Well, maybe. Maybe in the future. Yeah. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? So, in the end, we... All of us in the group, like there, I think there was maybe ten people. I don't actually remember how many people there were. There was quite a few of us, but we thought we'd um, put some things into the publication. So um, the sustainable dark room, Hannah put together um, a publication that I'm sure you're aware of. And um, this is still not a solution. So we decided to kind of just put together some little illustrations, kind of trying to experiment, um, demonstrate our experiment as if we were kind of future gallop. Um, futuristic beings kind of going to an earth food shop to try and pick up some items for some sort of weird dinner party um, so just repurposing a few of our fragments and playing with the idea of a fictional event um, which was was quite fun to put together but it wasn't a replacement for the actual event which would be really nice if it still happens. <laughs> Gemma you put in here it was then you've you've coined it as the Pisco Sour Oh yeah, that was the other one. <laughs> but this this was an inspiration in a way. I don't know if you've come across any of you have come across this project. Inez de Nos Santos um, did a collaboration with a group of artists, Coco Crampton and others. I can't remember everybody. Actually, I should have looked that up. Sorry. Um, but this is Tender Touches, which was a cafe that was also everything was art in the entire place, and you could go in and it was a performance. Um, and everything you ate was art and everything had been carefully put together I think it's I found it a really inspiring project um, so that uh, watch this space for a supper club mm. and then I guess we're moving on sort of to like what what have we been doing since so I've been burying things <laughs> um, and seeing what happens this is buried 16 millimeter film that collecting traces over the three month period and um, this one is in a gutter, um, which I recently learned as part of this little residency that I'm doing at the moment called Moon Gazing with the Icing Room and Muddy Yard. Um, apparently the gutters is a good place to collect moon dust. So potentially this 60 millimeter film um, contains micrometeorites, which pleased me when I looked at the stills, because you can imagine mm -hmm. that being in the future, like in space. Um, and then Gemma is working on Wild Alchemy Journal, which maybe you can talk about a bit more. And you were really generous in featuring both that's my work and then Hannah's work, who's also here, obviously, um, in the journal. So here's the journal. If you want to. Yes, the journal. Well, Wild Alchemy Lab, which is what we're also part of, is um, 
print radio digital publisher and an arts collective and this is the earth edition and each each edition explores a different element so the next one is fire and it's just exploring nature science and esoterica and we went on a kind of journey from through the cosmos down into the down through the mycorrhizal network into the earth into the caves the soil to the buried earth to hannah's working with clay and then kind of up into the into the ethers and yeah so maybe if hannah wants to just briefly explain about her work in that as well yeah sure um so for my work i was kind of collecting clay from different sites around the uk um and then filtering it through um different fabrics that i just had to hand so whether that was um like old pillowcases or random old curtains um and then kind of applying this to photographic paper um and the different minerals held within the clay from different sites kind of all created different um tones and formations on the surface of the paper um and then i was kind of either developing or fixing these they're kind of like a cross between a lumen print and a chemigram i guess um but then i was either developing them or fixing them in different homemade plant developers or different salt-based fixers um Interestingly, I found like on the subject of uh, urine and pee and stuff in my studio, I found this big bag of um, like salt blocks. And so I was like, oh, great, I can use this to make a salt based fixer. And then um, I had someone in my studio and they were looking at this tray full of like these big salt blocks. And they were like, oh, are these um, the blocks that you find in men's urinals? <laughs> so I was like, oh, that's what they are. So I'd actually been like fixing all my photographs in like blocks from urinals. <laughs> <laughs> Probably what it worked though, did it? It worked well, yeah. So delightful. <laughs> the my images didn't need fixing or developing at all. It's just what you see is what you get on the film. So that's things growing onto the 16 millimeter over time. So it's kind of um mould dirt that's accumulated on a 16 millimeter it's a film still that when you blow it up you kind of get this macro world that has a slightly cosmic kind of feel it feels some of them feel quite out of space um but they're actually tiny tiny fragments of like microbes and mold and things that have grown on the film mm. i felt happy to be next to your work hannah i admire your work <laughs> yeah it's a nice pairing yeah yeah but um when's your next one out Gemma I know Kathy's just said it's sold out where can you are you doing another well, one of this say that the there are a few that have been held back for the kickstarter campaign because the fire edition which um where Laura's also going to get involved with um is also going to be have an application so it's augmented so you'll be able to to, to scan the page and have audio visual content and 3D content come alive. So keep an eye out. And then when we have the campaign, if you ever want to support, that'd be lovely. Amazing. Um, it was a nice bit of crossover because when we caught up recently um, to talk about the Wild Al your Wild Alchemy Journal, um, I, the band that I'm in, we've recently been doing like an EP split into three and we're, because being a musician at the moment is really difficult. Um, you can't play gigs or, you know, we everyone knows the situation. It's quite tough as a musician right now. So the band that I'm in, our album's coming out, but we decided to split it into three EPs where we could kind of have a bit of fun with making kind of conceptual band merchandise. Um, and so each of the EPs um, is loosely based on an element quite abstract in some ways when you listen to the music but the first one was earth which was um no the first one was water this so me and Gemma are out of sync <laughs> the second one is fire and our third one will be earth so the fire was this and I sent a it's it's band merch that's um experimenting with whether fire needs to be real to be to be believed um a couple of years ago with 
the Dark Hour Collective, I did an installation which was all about fake fire um, to see as an experiment if people would still feel at home. So it smelt like I had a bonfire incense candle, a Foley soundtrack of fake fire um, and was projecting fire into a fireplace and kind of had set it up. So it was quite homely and it was really strange how um, everyone <laughs> congregated around this fake fire. So this art collection is all about how fire can be fake and still give you a sense of home. So there's instructions for how to make fake fire, but there's also to make fire hyper real, which is these um, pine cones that change the color of fire. And um, um, my good friend, Emma Harry did this beautiful painting. Emma might be here actually. Hi Emma, if you are. Emma's an amazing painter and she painted this perfect um, colorful flame based on what the fire looked like when we burnt with the pine cones. So it's yeah, that's great. What are they special pine cones or pine cones in general make that? Um, it's it's basically like A level chemistry, like things like barium, um, turn it's what you make fireworks out of, coated pine cones that then turn fire green or purple, or um, ah. you, you get like a mixture of tones. So it's, mm. it's just to make fires hypnotic anyway, because we're kind of drawn to fire because we mm. want to master it. But um, but um, if you make it, you can make it even more mesmerizing if you add kind of a color spectrum to it. So that's that's what we've been, me and Emma have been playing about with. Mm -hmm. So yeah, and that brings us to the end of our little chat, official chat. Um, there was one little question for you um, from Fiona though about, because I remember you saying you struggled with the, putting this 16 millimeter through a projection. Projector, was it too lumpy? Because you were struggling with that. Yeah, it, um, in the end, I sent it to the amazing James Holcomb, who seems to be so open-minded about whether, if you send him a bag of film that's moldy, like <laughs> he'll telecine it. So he, he telecined it for me. It's not quite in focus, so you couldn't really project it big because um, the surface of the film is is it's three dimensional. So to get a really crisp image is quite it's quite difficult. Um, and I think he kind of kept the film gauge quite loose so that it wouldn't transfer too much onto um, the telecine machine. But he 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 generously um, whacked it through his telecine machine and then digitized it for me, um, and then had to clean the machine. So I was grateful for that, but um, I need a way to be able to do it myself because it's a big ask. So making um, film in that way is, um, yeah, it, it, it can damage equipment. So you need you need like to make sure that you get a really good method of cleaning and like being quite disciplined with like using canned air to like clean your projector through. Um, but it worked, and I was really happy. Every still was completely different, and it's totally mesmerizing. Um, yeah. So there was a few people that had questions, weren't there? Or like things do you wanted to chat about? Like, yeah. So Fiona, who just asked that same question, should I stop share now? And then I can't. I can't see you all. Stop share. Well, if you do that, then you can see everyone, can't you? But you haven't been able to see everybody. Uh, so Fiona, yeah, Fiona does some brilliant work with feral practice and has been working with ants and so we were talking about how what we could do with ants and we sort of thought one thing would be to have a, on a photographic piece of paper to have the ants and how you would guide them I mean you could you could draw in um sugar sugar syrup or you could use radio waves or however you want to guide them into shape and then you would need to flash gun them with a light to 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 expose it and I think Laura you had an idea as well about I didn't know if it would work, but I thought maybe you could do lumen prints with ants if you if you had like sugar syrup in the middle or something that would attract them, and then you release the ants if they congregated for long enough. You might get you might be able to get a lumen print of um, the ants, but I don't. Yeah, it would be. I think it would be worth a try, but it might be tricky. Mm, thanks. I was thinking that maybe I could bury some sixteen millimeter film in an ant nest and see what happened. Oh yeah, definitely yeah. do that. Yeah. That would be yeah. cool. Great idea. And also the other thing I was thinking about was just in terms of chemistry, I'm using formic acid with painting and I just wondered about, you know, cause mm. that's what ants use for stings. But you can actually, I mean, it's pretty nasty stuff actually. Uh, people use it for 
a sort of miticide and other kinds of tanning leather and whatnot, but um, you can buy it. So um, I'm sort of experimenting with how it um, changes color basically. So I don't know whether it would have a, a potential use in, in the photographic process. Ooh, it may that's do. really interesting. It would because it's also ants. I mean, I'm going around to like crash ants, but I think because they have also very high in uh, ascorbic acid, so there would be a vitamin C replacement in the photographic process. So I don't know, you could try the butterfly pea solution um, because and see if there if there's a sort of like change in the colour the yeah. acid with the um, if you first of all made a wash with the tea, which would be blue, and then added, you could draw, add some uh, sugar syrup, which would be pink, and then purple with the ants, potentially. Yeah, yeah. You could also experiment. You could also, with 16 millimeter, you could get, um, you could get just leader, so it isn't photographic at all. So it's just like the, yeah. the, the resin, and then maybe coat it in something that ants find tasty, and then perhaps <laughs> they would not only excrete and react with it but they might also eat it and then you get you get holes in the film potentially yeah i know that there is someone i think um who joanna mays who did a talk i think with london um art photo for one of these talks before i think if i'm not wrong she might be trying to make kelp into 16 millimeter so actual oh. actual kelp putting the holes in it so that you can <laughs> literally project seaweed. But I don't know how she's getting on with that, but um, that was what one was her name again? Um, Joanna Mays. She runs a project oh. called Oh, I can't remember. Mays Creative. That's the name of it. It's a corner. They they they're a group that are based in Cornwall. Uh, Joanna Mays. Yes, yeah, she spoke during our um, symposium last month, which is available to view on our YouTube channel. So you can um, hear her bit of the talk on there. She doesn't talk about um, making seaweed into 16 mil, but she talks a lot about like making papers with it and uh, like projecting her films onto it in different ways, um, as well as developing with seaweeds and stuff. Uh, recommend books and reliable reading on the alchemy of plants and astroherbalism. Yes. Well, May next year, I'll have written my book. <laughs> 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 but in the meantime, yeah, I'll put I'll pop some people in the chat. Mm. Um, yeah. Any other? Uh, any? Any? I'd also like to make like an open call for anyone who wants to get involved with the World Alchemy Lab. If any, I know there's lots of artists and creatives out there, so um, you can reach us at hello at World Alchemy Lab. Uh, yep. And what kind of like uh, things are you looking for, like working towards with the World Alchemy Lab? Well, I mean, it's, there's, there's the different platforms. So there's the radio, the podcast and the, the journal. And now we're working, now we're digitizing it with the augmented content. So it's, it's really quite far reaching and then drawing different artists together. So the main thing is, is joining the dots. So one artist is doing one thing and then I'll put, pair them with another or with writers, with artists and different, really trying to kind of mix up different modalities and disciplines. And like, so you, and also as a collective, what's interesting is you kind of see yourselves as part of, of that or like running out of it. Um, so I was just kind of wondering if that's something you like ever envisaged for the lab or has it been quite like an organic um, growth and formation? Was there somebody here that wanted to talk about sauerkraut? Have we talked about that yet? Because that was a... Well, I just put it out there in, it's, it is, I don't know if Leo is on, Unfinished Business. So Leo does um, oh, yeah. sauerkraut sessions. And so I was thinking that what we could do with that was during the sauerkraut 
the spell sessions of actually making sigils, drawing with the sauerkraut onto the photographic paper and casting spells that way using geometry and symbols. Mm -mm -mm. There's a question here in the chat from Jess. Um, do you have any books you would recommend on the chemical properties of plants? Hmm. Yeah, I'm just adding in some uh, read a little reading list. I've got some up on my shelf. I might have to dig them. It's not it's not related to photography actually, but I've got quite a nice book on making wild inks. It's just called Make Ink. Yeah, and botanical inks um, is also another lovely book. Um, he does some beautiful wild animals. Babs Behan. I think this is woefully toxic. Um, but <laughs> my plan was to try and go through this and understand the chemistry. Keepers of the Light. It's a really, really brilliant compilation of like, it was actually Nettie who may be here, I don't know. Hi Nettie, if you are Nettie from the Sustainable dark room residency that recommended this and it's good thank you it's not about plants it's about photography i was also wondering i feel like like food and the sensory experience is quite a big part of how you guys come together and that's been really limited like currently because you can't have any of those experiences or if you do you know you're like more on your own or you're doing it for yourself rather than like you know going somewhere and having that experience um even with like using the, the sound from the plants um and I was wondering kind of how if you tried to adapt that at all during this time or whether it was just kind of like in something that you've you've thought about like planned for things in the future and just had to like put on hold or whether there's been an element of like trying to somehow make it work in the virtual realm we haven't have we we haven't i think um it's sort of we, yeah i think the, the lockdown kind of put a bit of a, a stop to we didn't we didn't talk about trying to make it virtual anyway did we but then I guess Hi. other things cropped up. Um, no, I guess you could say. Although, hang on, we did think about them um, suggesting a cocktail that everyone could uh, make this weekend for the full moon, didn't we? Yeah, yeah. that's quite cool. We, we could <laughs> so send you know send out ingredients to people, or you know some of the more accessible <laughs> forage ingredients, and then you know everybody has their. Has their bits and pieces. Yeah. Katie's so saying no we please. <laughs> no we. No, it was um hang on, let me try and find it. it was it's gonna be lavender fennel. lavender milk infused. I mean it also seems I'm not sure if everyone has the ingredients to hand, but it's lots of things okay. in the lavender infused milk and honey cocktail. That everyone needs tasty. to have one of these on Saturday night while they watch the full moon. Yeah, and if anyone wants, anyone has an idea and is looking for someone else to collaborate with, then they're also welcome to email the hello at wildalchemylab.com and then then we can do the, the connecting people thing. Um, and then if we have time, it, it would be interesting to hear from Catherine about her um, tree cameras. Yeah, yeah she's this just, is a, that's amazing. Yeah, Hi. so my tree camera project um, is it started off with the idea of um, I've read the research about tree communication and the way that they can use the fungal networks to um, communicate with each other and so I've been doing things like putting the um, mycelium under the microscope and looking at it in a very sort of scientific and traditional digital photographic way. Um, but then I realized that that's actually not really what I enjoy. I like doing sort of more weird stuff. <laughs> and so I started to find trees that had got natural cavities in and then putting light sensitive paper and film in the cavities in the trees um, and then sealing it with a pinhole lens, um, leaving them for a few months and then coming back and getting them out. And then it's really nice because you, you get a sort of solargram image 
but also you get a sort of um, bioglyph chemical recording of the tree as well. And so I'm currently working on a book where it will sort of be one page is the front of the paper and then the other page is the back of the paper. Mm. And then I've ended up back in the microscope room anyway, because I'm now putting a photographic paper under the microscope to see how being placed in a tree for a few months has, um, you know, messed with the chemistry of the paper, basically. Um, but I'm happy to talk to anyone about um, collaborating or just anything weird and plant-based, I'll be into it. <laughs> Great. Yeah, really I think you going at Fair and Practice will have some good stuff to talk about as well. And, Can uh, I join your chat too? That sounds brilliant. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's very exciting. Yeah. There's a question for you, Laura. When you buried the film, did you say that those effects you saw were not to do with the light sensitivity but the contact of the film with the soil yeah so I did a whole series of them um I, th I think the stills that I showed you just then were actually kind of not completely submerged at all points they were it was kind of um a mixture of above the soil and below the soil um in a place that was quite damp and humid um so I think the soil um the humidity in the soil made things grow um the ones that were completely buried underground were, were very muddy and full of traces so I dried those out and let them let them dry so that it was um so that you had the trace of the soil um but the ones that I was most interested in were the ones where um they were kind of top surface and slightly submerged where they started to grow things they were the, that was when they sort of when the film became part of the earth and it started to it came alive they were the ones that I was most interested in. I also wrapped film around trees, put it put it through gutters. Um, I've, I've put it in branches of a tree and left it there for a long time before. Um, just different different ways. I quite enjoy the question like how can you collaborate with nature or how can you make how can you make nature make the art? <laughs> and then I just facilitate nature to be the artist. It's like a bit of a silly joke sometimes that I play with myself about how little I can do um, and call it um, a collaboration. <laughs> so yeah, I've stopped calling myself a photographer and call myself a collaborator now or a yeah. sort of facilitator sort of thing. That's kind of how I feel as well. Mm. But I guess- I, I like your film burying as well. That's something that I've been trying to figure out recently. The closest I can come, I because I like making the sort of chemical prints on the, the film, but then also I like the visual element of a photogram. So I've been trying to find ways of combining all different types of sort of photogram with, you know, bioglyph or with um, you know, chem chemogram or something like that. So I was thinking, I haven't tried it yet, but I've, I've been making boxes out of really thin wood. And I thought if I actually bury the box as a pinhole camera with the lens sticking out of the soil, then hopefully the box itself will get like, you know, really moldy and disgusting. And then the paper in the back of the box will get the kind of chemical imprint of the wood and of the dirt, as mm. well as capturing a photo. So that's um, next on my to-do list. That sounds interesting as well. I'm, I've got quite interested in different type, types of geology um, and what mm. you could, like what certain rocks, if they were ground down, the chemistry of certain rocks might react with coloured film um, in a mm. chemogram way. I'm interested in trying that on 60 millimeter. I'm sure it's there's other people that have been doing that. I'd be interested if anyone has, but like things like using iron or, or rocks that are high in iron or um, yeah, different, different site specific places, going places where the geology is interesting and seeing if you can almost get a kind of um, a film that's really specific to the geology of that place using the chemogram process mm similar to the way the phytogram looks. Um, yes. which is kind of colour. Um, Daru Montag, I'll put him in the group chat. Um, but he did a load of stuff about burying film and he buried film in vertical strips. And so you can see how the quality of the soil um, changes. Amazing. Yeah, on the amount of sort of bioactivity at each layer of the strip. So, you know, in the really rich soil, there's loads of places where it's been, and um, the gelatin has been consumed by the microorganisms. But then further down in the dry soil, it's like the, the film's still pretty much fine because there's just so little um, microscopic life living there. That sounds super interesting. 
Yes, I've put um, his name in the chat. Thank you. Fiona's just suggested someone called Sam Hodge who does amazing site specific paintings with ink made from rocks, etc. Yeah, thank you. Also, lichen might be interesting because it's so, it's so, 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 so acidic. It, you know, the way it etches itself into rocks that that could be. That's another thing that Joanna Mays, who we talked about earlier, is just from her Instagram, I've seen that she's been working with lichen a lot at the moment. Yeah, no, definitely. I will stress that she only uses lichen, which has um, like been washed off roofs and things like that. So yeah. she's very aware of like not picking it from the yeah, yeah. um, habitat. Um, so yeah, because it's such a slow growing um, organism. Really, really good advice. Yes. Um, I'm sure that they didn't, a completely irrelevant side comment which is probably really um, irrelevant now I'm talking and it's coming out of my mouth but didn't they realize that a cave painting in Spain was probably made by the Neanderthals and not um, Homo sapiens because the lichen was 65,000 years old or something it was because of the lichen that they knew that so Neanderthals were creative amazing um, thanks lichen um, lichen dyes. Um, Louise is saying, I work with lichen dyes. I only use lichen that's fallen off branches where people in, there are people in Scotland that have lichenases. I'm not sure. I've, oh, licenses. Sorry, I thought that was a lichen thing um, <laughs> to collect lichen for dye. Um, and um, Al, Al, I don't know how you pronounce Al Mundinia's word name actually, but I've seen yeah. her name so many times. Um, wild plants for printing yeah amazing i also just put us into the chat um this brilliant artist who we discovered on instagram who who um uses wild dyes and snails to make images which is just like the most delightful thing i'm sure there's space for something with that too um i think what's been a really nice kind of overall thread of oh. this dialogue um has been like more of collaborations with nature as well as um as well as other kind of like disciplines and ways of making artwork um and i think you guys very much see you know your practice as just like an overall exploration into you know plants and alchemy um and the earth rather than a photographic practice um and as you said at the beginning like none of you see yourselves as photographers um and yet it all kind of it ties into you know maze ways of making photography in different ways and i think that just highlights the fact that like photography and making you know making work with light is just so entangled within kind of the earth as a wider ecosystem. Um, and that's definitely kind of how we want to, how we want to readdress our approach to photography. Um, so I just kind of wanted to draw together those ideas um, in some kind of like, conclusive end but yeah I think um I think it's been great to it was great to have the three of you on the initial residency um especially because you didn't think originally that you'd be able to kind of do it and to have your different kind of knowledge and approaches um and also you're quite um you set yourselves quite a strict um, task for each day, you know, and quite a lot to cover. And you, you covered an amazing amount of ground in just kind of like five or six days. Um, and you've, you know, managed to like fill a whole presentation with most of it. Um, and I think, you know, hopefully, I think I can, I think I can see that it will, has kind of influenced then things going forward. Um, and yeah, hopefully we can do more collaborations and I look forward to like what you guys are 
planning next? I don't know if you do have any like plans already, like on the horizon for future like workshops or events or just explorations. Explorations, I think that's, <laughs> that's yeah. Good. We were inspired by doing this talk actually and and coming together again because I think in lockdown especially we're not we haven't seen each other in person and then we just said to each other oh actually yes let's get doing planning something else yeah and the journal obviously Jenna's very busy well yeah. it's a yeah. different country and <laughs> yeah. um, when we're all in the same space but the thing we, what we wanted to do as well was um uh clear McKenna who I put in Terence McKenna's daughter who, who I think I put into the chat we wanted to go and do the gorilla her gorilla style which is going out into the night with a with a big sort of black box and doing the rubbings onto the bark mm. it's being like physically being in nature when we're creating and like yeah possible again or, the, love to do that. or Laura's survival idea yeah I've been manifesting um that for quite a while uh, yeah I like the idea of um kind of wild camping and you have like I think I was telling Hannah about this when we first met Hannah it was like I like the idea of having a, a store of food um that's either forageable or things that you've brought with you to to sustain you for a duration of time um and all of that food has photographic potential to draw with light um and then um it's a kind of toss-up between how much art you make versus how much you eat um over the course of the time which I think is a metaphor for the art world really um but it would also be an immersion in nature but uh, yeah I was going to do that last year but it had to get cancelled with the Bothy project but um yeah um I've been slightly manifesting a kind of e experimental collaborative um expedition research thing um that is very in the early stage well i've been thinking about it for ages actually we've talked about it so if anyone's interested <laughs> but i think um doing sort of site specific stuff i think emily um i know Gemma, you're away at the moment but maybe we should chat <laughs> some more yeah yeah or we could go to, no we can't not yet can't we go can't, no. not now not yet <laughs> but um yeah trees ants snails all of this stuff um I'm quite inspired by lots of people's things. Yeah, it's, really yeah, it's nice been great. Yeah. Really fun. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Hannah. Thanks. You're very welcome. Um, but yeah, it's been really lovely to have such a um, kind of diverse and um, energetic dialogue from everyone who joined us this evening. Um, and hope to see some of you at our next um, artist talk. Um, I think our next one will be in March and we're doing it um, as part of Format Festival, which LAPC are exhibiting at. Um, so yeah, I hope to see some of you there. And thanks again to yeah. Emma, Emily, sorry, always combining your names, <laughs> Emily, Gemma and Laura um, for your really rich, um dialogue this evening and for sharing so many knowledge so much knowledge references and readings um i'm sure everyone's going to go away with a big list of books and websites and artists to keep them occupied <laughs>